Uh, okay. Hello, Gonzalez. You hear me? Yes, yes, I do. Okay, very good, very good indeed. Um, I think it's time to start for this uh, webinar. Uh, we have already, I don't know how many members or who registered for this uh, seminar today, for this evening. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody uh, today. Uh, we will discuss uh, in the after uh, pandemic or in the post pandemic era, um, where the world actually is heading, perhaps just providing a framework of discussion. But the focus, uh, of course, uh, is the, on the uh, future of uh, Europe, uh, especially EU based uh, uh, European integration process and uh, future of. Uh, EU. There have been a lot of discussion nowadays, uh, and the, actually everybody, I mean, as academics, with my colleagues, I don't know how many uh, this kind of online uh, talks I have involved in the last uh, a couple of weeks, indeed, there have been growing uh, interest in discussion uh, how this uh, pandemic and the management uh, of the crisis uh, actually uh, will affect the future of the global order in terms of practical um, aspects of global governance, uh, but also regional wise, uh, how it will uh, impact the uh, running mechanisms, government mechanisms of the regional uh, international uh, integration process, especially uh, in European uh, continent. Of course, uh, in the last seven decades in the post-Second World War era, I think one of the most successful uh, projects uh, in the world history in terms of creating um, an integration uh, process economically, politically, uh, financially, and human-wise integration. At the very cradle of uh, Westphalian international order. EU was and has always been uh, acclaimed and appreciated as a kind of uh, peace process, indeed. Uh, if we just compare the First World War, Second World War conflicts, the blood conflicts, in, uh, the, one of the bloodiest uh, conflicts in, in the world's history, especially in the 20th century, how Europe showed the courage, indeed, uh, to bring the different nation states, pulling the sovereignty of the nation state and creating a successful project, putting an example uh, for the rest of the world. And that was the image and perception of what the EU represents, actually, uh, security, stability, economic uh, welfare, development-wise, creating growth and wealth, enormous prosperity for everybody and uh, creating the first experience of human uh, being uh, in the modern time a supranational uh, entity uh, with the, uh, I mean, uh, pretty success. Of course, the turning point of war I was, for me at least, for the uh, showing the limitation of such an integration uh, as a turning point was 2004, I guess. The, the failed experience of uh, creating a United States of Europe uh, by creating a uh, constitution which was not approved by some critical uh, um, members of the EU and then failed. And the uh, founding uh, international treaty of Rome has been revised and today's 
uh, EU have been uh, kind of revised uh, to stay as an international, not so, uh, uh, unity uh, government of a region, but a uh, uh, stable region, uh, stable government, uh, stable international organization, but still an international organization, not the uh, uh, United Europe uh, as the single entity. I remember discussion from uh, Kissinger uh, sometimes uh, used to say as kind of criticism uh, against the EU for a while. Um, how, I mean, if I am going to call on behalf of uh, Europe, to whom I will call from Washington DC. So in order to give a sense of uh, uh, lack of an um, united identity uh, of uh, go united government uh, in Europe. That was a criticism, but have you said that, uh, I mean, everybody uh, was, especially in the post-Cold War era, uh, kind of imitating uh, in different regions of the world, uh, the success story of uh, Europe as an example and an inspiring uh, united entity for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the world, and uh, as Turkey being part of this story, but only on the periphery, not the at the corner or at the uh, core or center of the this EU project. We have been uh, closely following uh, since the 1950s this uh, great story of uh, European integration, and indeed, I mean, economically speaking, Turkey is part of. Uh, EU as a custom union, you know, member of custom union, but politically we are not uh, yet uh, uh, as a full member for politically uh, speaking. And there is a growing, there has been always growing interest in Turkey. But what happened in the last decade or so, uh, of course, uh, a kind of uh, development actually um, demystify the image of what. EU represents, the, especially in the uh, after the aftermath of 2008 and 2009, the financial crisis, the, uh, in terms of economic management, but also growing um, new fascist parties, anti-immigration uh, movement, uh, xenophobia, Islamophobia, and most recently, uh, of course. Uh, against this uh, refugee crisis, all brought uh, uh, a new discussion. And of course, I uh, I will come to this point and I will give the floor to the, our uh, presenters today. But I just want to set out uh, uh, what we will discuss today. And this corona crisis actually came to all, all uh, magnify all these issues uh, in the European uh, settings. And today, um, Actually, I would like to very much interest in, I mean, to listen uh, my dear colleagues, uh, uh, one from uh, participating from, um, are you both of in Madrid now or uh, Brazil? Stuff? You are from London. Are you? Okay. We have two distinguished guests today to for discuss all this uh, issue together. One is uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Borja Gonzalez Fernandez uh, from the University of Autónoma de Madrid. Welcome, my dear colleague. Hello. Hello. And uh, also uh, Professor uh, Dr. Branislav Radelic. Radelic uh, uh, actually, he's currently uh, at the University of Nebrija in Spain, but uh, uh, as a Resident, he's in London, as far as I know. He might explain later, but both of them are uh, studying different subjects in international politics, being uh, from Europe. And uh, I myself, uh, Professor Dr. Birol Akgün, I am the, uh, still teaching international politics at the uh, Ankara Yildirim Beyazıt University. Previously, I have been also teaching and uh, served as a uh, vice rector and dean at the Nejmetin Erbakan University. Today, uh, actually, they are the host. They are hosting this uh, 
meeting today at the Nejbet Arbukan Universities uh, Studies Center, uh, and its uh, chairman, Dr. Uh, uh, he is also my ex students, uh, Dr. Uh, Gökhan Bozbash. Uh, I'm also thankful to them for providing this uh, good platform to discuss uh, how will this coronavirus will affect uh, the future of uh, Europe. Um, for uh, the structure of the discussion, I don't know how many uh, times you might need, uh, my colleagues. Uh, we can start with the 10 minutes, then maybe one, um, uh, five more minutes uh, if we need it, uh, depending on the, uh, your presentation. Uh, so you have one, uh, one hour, 15 minutes maximum to uh, uh, finish up all, all discussions. There must be some questions as well. We have to provide the uh, opportunity for our listeners to also uh, raise some issues as well. Uh, okay, uh, let let me uh, start with uh, uh, providing uh, some. Um, I mean, giving the floor to Professor Branslav or Radalic. Uh, the back is yours, uh, Doctor. But I cannot hear you, though. I, I, me neither. Okay. Yeah. Benzda. Unfortunately, no. No, me neither as well. <laughs> uh, okay. okay. Let's try. Um, Actually, let, let's let's change the uh, tone. Uh, Doctor Gonzalez. Yes. Uh, let, let 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 us start with you. Then I we come back to to just save time. Huh? Okay. So uh, how many minutes do we have? Ten minutes to begin with. Of course, ten minutes. Then uh, maybe new question and new time. Yeah, ten minutes first. Okay. So. I had gotten ready for, for a little bit longer than 10, than 10 minutes, but I will try to summarize. Uh, first of all, I would like to begin by, by thanking Nejmetin Erbakan University for inviting me to, to this event. Uh, though I am not a particularly an expert on the matter of, of the European Union, as a European I feel nonetheless personally concerned by, by the present crisis and as a student of political institutions, uh, I couldn't lose the opportunity to express my own ideas and concerns on the matter. I had a presentation ready, uh, which I had up uploaded before, but uh, before going any further, I would like to begin with uh, two newspaper clippings I, I got from the Spanish press in, in, recent, in recent days. The first one dates from April the 29th, and the story goes as follows. Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte was visiting a factory when a worker shouted out, don't give money to Spaniards and Italians. To the amusement of the chief executive who responded, no, 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 while laughing. The other uh, newspaper clipping I found uh, relevant was published on March the 27th in the aftermath of one of the special meetings of the Council to discuss the economic measures to be implemented in order to tackle the, the pandemic. And in the course of the meeting, the Dutch Minister of Finance, Vopke Hoekstra, charged against Spain and Italy for their inability to rationalize their public accounts during the recent years of economic expansion, which, he went on, had weakened their ability to effectively respond to the impact of the pandemic. While uh, Hoekstra's statement elicited condemnation across Europe, with the Portuguese Prime Minister as a particularly vehement critic of his words, both newspaper clippings I have just referred to recall the explosion of national stereotypes that accompanied the severe financial and economic crisis experienced by the European Union uh, in recent years, thus revealing both the weakness of the identity side of the European project and the increasing penetration of mildly xenophobic, Eurosceptic discourses among an elite that had traditionally been impervious to such points of view. Europe is in crisis, indeed, 
as recent surveys uh, demonstrate, uh, increasing numbers of Europeans, especially in, in the south of Europe, uh, are no longer confident in, in the Union and an important percentage of them want to leave the, the EU altogether. This is uh, particularly true in, in the case of recent uh, surveys referring to Italy, but it has also been the case for Greece ever since the recent uh, economic crisis suffered by the country. While these data confirm the, the malaise that is affecting Europe ever since the, the recent economic crisis, truth is that the origins of this discontent go well beyond the Union's lackluster performance in dealing with pressing policy issues to plunge its roots deeply into the shortcomings and efficiencies of the European project that became evident, as Professor Atkin said in his, in his uh, introduction, with the failure of the Constitutional Treaty after 2004, between 2004 and 2006. Uh, the failure of the Constitutional Treaty actually put an end to the federalizing process that had been a very prominent part of the European construction movement ever since the adoption of the Single European Act in the late 1980s. And in fact, the failure of the, of the Constitutional Project serves, serves us to highlight the absence of a European demos, of a common European identity, after 50 years of European construction. In fact, the adoption of the Treaty of Lisbon, and perhaps even more importantly than that, the resolution of the German Constitutional Court of June the 30th, 2009, where the derivative and therefore not sovereign character of EU law was underlined, um, reveals this turn towards a more intergovernmental and less supranational um, structure where, states where the states remain the masters of the treaties, as the court herself said. It can be argued, though, that the path opened by the single European Act was not without, it, without its complications. And in fact, the ratification of the Treaty of Maastricht was in itself a complex process. We were within Denmark, whose result was negative. The referendum in France was positive, but as the literature says, it was a petit oui, a small yes. And in fact, the Union was to experience in the 1990s a first episode of Euroscepticism. But in my opinion, at that point in time, there was still an elite committed to the process of European integration that wanted to keep on moving forward with an even enhanced union, as was proven by the treaties of Amsterdam, Nice, and lately the ill-fated constitutional treaty. In his study of the French constitutional, uh, European constitutional referendum, Raphael Frank pointed out at the importance of the internet as a means to voice out public discontent and to express points of view and opinions traditionally silenced by mainstream media. The exponential growth in the diffusion of the internet ever since the beginning of the present century, and even more importantly, the rise of social media networks as new spaces for the diffusion of information has been vital for the popularization of anti-establishment discourses and the concomitant appearance of new Eurosceptic, or better still, Eurocritical movements all across the continent with Italy, as I had said, as a case in point, having turned from one of the most enthusiastic proponents of a further union to an increasingly ambiguous, when not openly hostile, participant in the European project. In, the context, in this context, the media hegemony of traditional press, press outlets has been substituted by an uncontrollable flow of information of dubious reliability constantly shared through countless overlapping networks. The dictatorship of Twitter transformed into the primary vehicle of political communication, even in countries with low or elite-only Twitter penetration, and the growing weakness of the traditional political parties. Uh, we've seen a pattern of uh, the quasi-bipartisan legislatures of Europe turning into increasingly fractured uh, parliaments. Uh, them, uh, themselves a byproduct of, of the fractured media landscape has esteemed the ability of the political elite to accept compromise on long-term policy goals for fear of losing a couple of popularity points in the ever-present demoscopic study. 
uh, thus uh, jeopardizing their weak coalitions. The rise of the masses, as was prophesied by the Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset in the 1920s, has become a most frightening reality a century afterwards. Uh, the changes in the political behavior brought about by the digital revolution have been furthermore coupled with the underdevelopment, as I said before, of a European demos. The sheer size of the Union and its linguistic diversity have proven to be almost unsurmountable barriers for the development of a European public sphere, which together with the resilience demonstrated by the nation state uh, has thoroughly hampered the development of a sense of peoplehood, as Richard Bellamy explains, uh, which is a fundamental requirement for the implementation of re successful redistributive measures. In simpler words, we are more inclined to help others or to accept sacrifices for the sake of others if they belong to the same group as ourselves. Uh, following this argument, uh, I think that it seems quite difficult to construct a new European identity ex nihilo and above the strong national attachments that still characterize the solid European nation states. While it could be counter-argued that the existence of strong national identities does not prevent the, sal the simultaneous rise of a strong attachment to another non-national object of affection, as has been variously proven in the literature, and moreover, that younger Europeans display higher levels of attachment to the Union as a whole, it is nonetheless true that the political and media transformations we have just talked about have transformed the relation of the European citizenry towards the Union from a mightly acquiescent framework characterized by permissive consensus to an increasingly hostile perception dominated by constraining dissensus. Um, while I per personally believe that the permissive consensus model could retain its validity, at least in times of, uh, per of economic prosperity and political tranquility, it is true that its validity sinks as soon as things start to get sour. As the recent financial crisis demonstrated, the cumbersome intervention of the EU in, in, to tackle macroeconomic imbalances in Southern Europe, uh, with dramatic consequences for the social cohesion of, of those countries, provoked a pervading wave of Euroscepticism insofar as the austerity measures demanded by the Union were perceived as the unfair impositions of an intrusive and undemocratic organization encroaching into the realm of sovereign authority of the state. The consistently low levels of approval for the EU as a whole, both in Italy and Greece, even after the worst episode of the crisis had passed, served to reveal, moreover, how the traumatic experiences lived at the hands of the revived Troika linger in the collective mind even after the onset of economic growth and the recovery of a modest prosperity. I will try to, to summarize the, the last part of, of my first intervention by saying that we are certainly living the worst health crisis in world history since the wrongly named Spanish flu back in 1918. At the moment when I was preparing this, uh, this paper, over 4 million people had been infected worldwide, with Europe becoming one of the regions most hardly hit by the, by, by the effects of the pandemic. Beyond the health uh, situation, uh, it is believed that the crisis will have a crippling impact on European economies, which are uh, expected to, to have a negative growth averaging minus 10% for the following, for this fiscal year, and even worse effects for a deficit, which will increase the already bulging European public debts. In this context, and despite the measures already undertaken by both the Commission and other union institutions, which we will be most certainly able to talk about later on, uh, truth is that the union has given ample examples of the lack of solidarity among its members, as well as of its inability to uphold some of its most sacred principles, and I'm talking about uh, freedom of movement, I'm talking about unhampered commercial competition, and while it is certain that the brunt of responsibility does not fall on EU shoulders, which after all, the, the Union only has a supporting competence in the field of healthcare, it is true that the present crisis has once again revealed the crippling weakness of the European project. The fact that the crisis has had an especial impact in the southern uh, 
European states, which had been the most hardly hit by the previous financial crisis, threatens moreover to bring back to the fore the, the fraught north-south divide, which had been already on the brink of breaking the union back in the early 2010s. In this sense, the recent uh, ruling of the German Constitutional Court just a, a week ago or something like that, uh, where it was said that the European Central Bank quantitative easing program was illegitimate insofar as it exceeded the, the ECB's mandate, not only contradicts a previous ruling of the European Court of Justice in sheer violation of principles of normative hierarchy, but also threatens to destabilize capital markets by putting in question the central bank's pledge to do whatever it takes, in words of Mario Draghi, in order to sustain the common currency and avoid a default risk. And the consequences of this uh, ruling are already perceived in both Italy and Spain with increased uh, ratios of sovereign debt risk um, levels. Moreover, the risk of a fresh epidemic outbreak, and we've seen uh, worrying signals both in Europe and in Asia, threatens to uh, put uh, an end to the de-escalation process is underway and uh, puts even further uh, pressure on the increasingly fragile European economies. It is, however, difficult to predict the future of European integration when we are still very much at the beginning of, of the crisis. But I believe that the Union has, as we say in Spanish, a mala salud de hierro, which means an ironclad bad health. Uh, and it refers to usually to people who, despite being sick, uh, survive many years and even outlive most of their contemporaries. Uh, during the previous crisis, we heard many, prophes many prophecies about the impending demise of the European Union, the downfall of the Euro, but then came, uh, then came Super Mario and opened the, the gates of money and the union managed to resist. I believe that the union will be able to, to do so now, but I also believe that it needs urgently an exciting process to engage the wider European population as a whole with the European project. If it does not manage to do so, it will eventually become a jail of nations shackled by the enslaving handcuffs of an unpayable debt. And that's for now my, my uh, first presentation, so to speak. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, almost 15 minutes just to keep the fairness, <laughs> the moderator. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no problem, no problem. As long as uh, you have done enough, I didn't want to intervene anything. Uh, it's a voice mostly to understand uh, the growing discontent from the periphery, at least, of today's uh, EU, especially from the southern perspective of what has been going on uh, in the south of uh, EU. We better understand with your uh, presentation. Uh, just uh, in the second part, perhaps just keep in, in your mind, will we see um, a serious um, kind of Brexit-like movements uh, by the governments of the southern states? Just keep in your mind for your uh, next section. Uh, and uh, now I am uh, returning to uh, Professor um, Branstow. Radelich, how, how do you pronounce yes, it? Yes, this is this is correct. Yes, ah, Radelich, uh, Radelich, and your voice is uh, excellent. Um, Thank you. I I I, I was reading. Uh, I let me show uh, the um, geopolitics after uh, COVID nineteen. Nineteen, yes. From uh, the, the economist. Economy. The economist, you might see it, okay? Yes, yes, I have seen that and I have, um, I have also, read the... Not from the popular one, but uh, 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 a little more um, academic uh, article by Professor uh, Zia Önish. He is teaching at the Kurt University here in Istanbul. And uh, his article, and he's also a good friend of us and he's a good scholar, international political economy matter. Reverse transformation, global shift, the core periphery divide, and the future of EU. Well, yeah. uh, it just came out very recently. Uh, what he's offered is the EU faces an existential crisis. 
the liberal core, which played an important role in transforming the illiberal regimes in much of post-war period, suffers from a series of setbacks. And he is asking whether the uh, non-democratic regimes in the world or some authoritarian understanding also pushing back the uh, liberal understanding of the Western, uh, the power of uh, EU as uh, uh, liberalizing or uh, stabilize a factor in its uh, region. Uh, Professor, um, how, how do you respond to that? I mean, I know you might have your own, of course, uh, ideas as a structure, but just keep in mind how, how this coronavirus is actually, the crisis it's creating uh, in terms of health crisis, human, human crisis, manager crisis uh, in the world, and especially in Europe, how would it affect the future of EU? Well, uh, you have. Uh, thank you very much for for having me. You have uh, touched upon in your introductory remarks um, upon some very important aspects with regard to the European Integrationist Project, and then um, my colleague uh, Borja has also touched upon some extremely important issues, uh, which I would like to unpack a bit more uh, with regard to the extremely important notion of European identity, because all the challenges that we have seen so far, um, and uh, here I refer primarily to the economic crisis, but then refugee crisis, but now COVID-19 um, have been powerful enough to challenge the notion of um, European unity. Mm. So um, the notion of, of European identity really started as an official um, idea with the introduction of the um, Declaration on European Identity, which was promoted in 1973 with the outbreak of the oil crisis. So it's, it was an economic crisis back in the 70s that somehow inspired the drafting of um, an official declaration on European identity. And then later on, actually, when some other aspects became Europe's reality, such as, for example, the presence of Islam in the West, mm -hmm. uh, in the 80s, with the establishment of many um, Islamic organizations, in particular in France and Germany, then the notion of European identity that we currently very often refer to was established and then promoted. Later on, with the Treaty of Maastricht and uh, certain changes, right, in the post-Cold War context, the notion of European identity expanded and it became, in fact, very popular for uh, scholars interested in the European integrationist project, but also for policymakers. And that is when we actually witnessed quite some discussion about European identity within certain institutions um, of the European Union, referring to the current understanding of the notion of European identity. So if we take a look at the official declaration on European identity back from the 70s, that document, which is pretty short, it is maybe 10 pages in total, and it is available on different web pages, consisted of three parts. The first part was about the unity of the then nine members of the European Economic Community. The second part was about the European identity in relation to the world. So how can the then European Economic Community position itself vis-a-vis -vis the rest of, um, well, European states as well, but uh, also um, other, um, the rest of the world. And the third really part of the official declaration on European identity was about the dynamic nature of the construction of a united Europe, which very much goes back to your previous point uh, about when calling Europe, which really dialing code you would need in order really to speak to somebody in Europe, where would you direct your your call. Uh, and then I mentioned that uh, really um, later developments in the 80s and 90s very much contributed to the current understanding of the notion of European identity. And uh, my, my colleague from, uh, from Madrid has very nicely touched upon really what re has threatened that understanding of, um, of European identity and whether it is really something 
possible to achieve and what kind of effort is required. Because if we talk about European unity or the future of uh, cooperation in, in the European Union, we have to consider really the role of individual participating member states of the European Union. We have to take a look at the European Union as a whole, meaning supranational institutions. But then we also have to consider the role of non-state actors that have become extremely powerful. We nowadays, for example, have social media that act as non-state actors that are evidently sometimes more powerful than certain states. And then we also come to the point of intellectuals. So do we matter in the discussion of the future of the European Integrationist Project. And Habermas, for example, has touched upon these, uh, these ideas in some of, some of his work about the role of intellectuals. Where are we in the debate about the future of Europe? Where are we in the debate about uh, post-COVID-19 world and so on and so forth? So, but if we then take a look at different initiatives pursued by different authorities of the European Union in relation to the question of European identity. We see that, for example, in 2007, uh, the Berlin Declaration was signed um, and uh, adopted um, the United in Diversity as its official motto. Then the year, for example, 2008 was um, the European Year of Intercultural Dialogue. But if you analyze documents that have accompanied those, for example, two um, important initiatives, you realize that actually European identity was not really mentioned. So we somehow tend to talk about it, but when a right opportunity arises to really unpack it, to say what we imply under the notion of European identity, somehow that is, that is missing. And I would argue that the reason why actually the, the notion of European identity is very somehow fluid um, is because of, of let's say three factors. The, the, the first one um, is about multicultural environment that we have in Europe and multicultural environment actually can hardly generate identity balance at the European Union level. The second aspect is about enlargement of the European Union. The, the European integrationist project is, is not complete. We do have countries that are hoping to become members of the European Union. And with this in mind, every new enlargement will add new layers to identity formation. And this is where Turkey is a very, very interesting case when it comes to the discussion of European identity and the accommodation in the end of Turkey in that, in that respect. And then the third notion, and in this current climate, maybe even the most important one, relates to the question of solidarity and tolerance. And uh, Borja very rightly mentioned before uh, how this COVID-19 uh, problem has actually exposed the lack of solidarity at the EU level. Even when Angela Merkel, for example, delivered her famous uh, speech on the 22nd of March, uh, talking about COVID and what Germany as a state was expected to do, she very much focused on Germany. And when actually PR experts analyzed her speech later on, they found very good, many good points in, in her 12 minute speech, but then at the same time, they actually said, well, but she did not mention solidarity at the EU level. It was very much about, in the end, intergovernmental, because later on, we saw actually the suspension of the Schengen Agreement, by the way, right? So we see that actually, when things are going well, Everybody is in favor of the European Integrationist Project. And here, when they say when things go well, we actually refer to economic performance of the European Integrationist Project, right? As soon as we have a crisis, be it economic crisis, be it refugee crisis, because refugee crisis can eventually become an economic crisis and political crisis, of course, then we realize that actually member states tend to slide towards the intergovernmental way of cooperation. 
So supranationalism is something very luxurious in the case of the European integrationist project. And for supranationalism, for member states to really be in favor of it, you really have to have some very, very solid economic ground so that states will say, oh, this is something very attractive. If you do not have that, and we've seen that with different crises, we've seen that uh, with the financial crisis and also with the migrant crisis, of course, and now we see even with COVID, we actually see that states somehow turn away from the supranational model and they're actually more in favor of intergovernmental cooperation. This then, going forward, opens the question of then economic nationalism, which can lead to political nationalism. And that is something uh, that is something dangerous. And that is something actually that we have seen certain members, certain political parties in the European Union have actually used or even abused to generate public support. So this is something that we that we that we have to um, have to take in, into consideration. Now, when we actually take a look at the European Integrationist Project and the members of the European Union, we actually see that we have a whole range of regimes within the European Union, right? So we have democracy, we have illiberal democracy, we have right-wing populism, we have um, semi-authoritarian regimes, and so on and so forth. So all these different regimes, of course, have their own interpretations of how the European Integrationist Project should look like going forward. And therefore, talking about greater uh, collaboration, talking about solidarity, talking about even the notion of European identity, all these aspects, no matter how attractive they, they are, they are actually complicated by different regimes and the oscillations that exist within certain countries participating in the European integrationist project. So going forward, even the question of enlargement will be about inclusion of, of new states, right? But at the same time, it can potentially lead to greater exclusion within the European Union, because we are obsessed with the notion of uh, core and periphery or core and semi-periphery. So if we think future states that will become members of the European Union, we can then question, will they ever become core? With this in mind, for example, and we have done a lot of work on the Western Balkans and um, relations between the Western Balkans and the European Union and the role of the European Union in the region, I tend to be very skeptical um, as to how much those states, even when they join eventually the European Union, can really progress within the European Union. So um, I, um, um, I have tried to, to unpack some, some of these ideas and yeah. um, I will be happy to, to talk more about really COVID and the United Kingdom and, and this idea about cooperation, but I, I wanted somehow to complement the, the great um, um, introductory remarks that you made and that um, Borja has made. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Brans Branslau. Um, I will... Uh enjoyed your ideas and certainly our listeners participants will uh, get deep inside uh, the weakness of the unity of europe uh, as a as it's presented uh, as a good image of um, attractive points for uh, possible e eu members like turkey uh, certainly it will be more i mean it is more illuminating that uh, actually, there is no well-defined, based on the shared values, uh, what we call, uh, what we can call uh, Europe or EU, indeed. I mean, as a formal uh, international uh, or organization. So, uh, indeed, I mean, for this matter, despite the fact that um, EU has been well-defined as a project of peace or uh, cre by creating. Um, Carl Deutsch, I think he used to say, a security community. Yes. But that was the point. But when it comes to hard times, which certainly put a great test of strength and endurance 
uh, for this kind of organization, it's not easy to sustain this discourse of whole united Europe that might be taken care of its poor, but also care of its stability uh, and security and prosperity for all. So the idea of the ever closer Europe, uh, ever closer EU, which is one of the titles of the books uh, on the area, uh, is not too much true. Indeed, there have been a lot of underlying uh, different difficulties, uh, dynamics involved in all this process. Uh, from my point of view, I think uh, I will give return back to Gonzalez, uh, perhaps some other questions as well, but uh, my understanding uh, is that uh, especially after Brexit, uh, then this uh, issue of the coronavirus uh, we have been suffering all over the world, uh, of course, and we are still at the very initial phases, very initial process, and we don't know yet, I mean, how the things will evolve eventually. This is the health and public health issue for time being. So what will be the economic impacts tomorrow? Uh, we don't know yet, I mean, the at least EU, in order to survive, not perhaps the political social, uh, on the base of political social values, but its functionality of, of um, providing its uh, ability to show solidarity, at least for the next step, by um, bring up the uh, all uh, nation states together and showing its unity to find solution for the economic uh, problems, growing, uh, the uh, decreasing growth, growing uh, jobless rates, uh, I don't know, inflation or others, but so everybody is talking about uh, a new Marshall Plan, uh, what's needed to, even some people are offer so-called Corona bonds, that you not supposed to be created, find a uh, common uh, solution for European economic future, and I think here uh, the issue of who is leading this EU, EU project. Uh, okay, I mean, EU as an economic uh, area of interest uh, and union uh, integration uh, in terms of economic matters so far successful, but uh, without. Um, uh, taking the burden of the defense issues and in, in the face of the break between uh, the uh, the new world, which is uh, American, the uh, Trump's America versus EU and the growing China, which is approaching to firstly to European Union market. So how will all these dynamics will evolve? We will see. But uh, Europe must take its future for its hand, and that for this reason, I mean, especially the core powers like Germany and France, I mean, must decide what kind of Europe, European Union, they will actually think of in their their mind. Will they? Are they ready to uh, take all the burden of undertake all the burden of uh, sustaining EU? Economically, especially, uh, they at least in the case of uh, 2009 crisis, in the case of Greece and some other crises, okay, uh, Chancellor Merkel somehow showed uh, at this its um, so, uh, German solidarity and willingness somehow find, uh, believe, I mean, finding a way to deal with the Greece uh, problems. But this time, after 10 years, uh, which certainly will be a, uh, harder and as Gonzalez just mentioned, uh, e e e German constitutional court decision with regard to EU central banks involved in the economic issue is really uh, is uh, a good uh, sign for the reading of um, at this uh, Germans uh, political elites uh, and and constitutional court is not the regular political elite. I mean it's a Real, I mean, hardcore of uh, German, indeed. I mean, 
how it's a good time for reading and understanding the the centers of the EU uh, okay, or what they call North. So what will be, I mean, what, what is the expectation of uh, Southern Europe, Gonzalez, uh, what they expect from Germany, France, access in order to find a solution if it's not available uh, and what is, will be the uh, reaction or response of how and the question of do we see a Brexit like um, movements uh, or action by people and by governments of southern uh, states like Italy and Spain? What do you think? Well, um, I have been writing uh, across both your interventions because you've made uh, very, very extremely interesting points. And um, building on some of the of the things you've both said, um, I believe that uh, the economy remains at the core of the success of of Europe. Yeah. As Sebastian Royo wrote um, already um, many years ago, uh, the, the the reason for Spain and Portugal to be so pro-European was based on the perceived benefic um, beneficial effects they had received from the Union after their integration. Now the present crisis um, is putting further pressure on already strained uh, economies, on already strained uh, public budgets. And um, just today I had the chance of, of reading in the newspapers that uh, ministers from Spain, Portugal, France and Italy had actually put forward a program for up to a trillion and a half euros to uh, start addressing some of the effects of coronavirus. They, they, they want to defend this plan together against what they perceive will be the, the opposition of uh, the austerity prone states of Northern Europe, essentially Denmark, Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, I don't see very, I'm not very optimistic. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen was expected to have presented her report on, on measures to tackle coronavirus on May the 6th. She, now they are talking that she will submit it by June the 6th uh, at the earliest uh, point. And um, building on the, on the newspaper clippings that I read in my first intervention, I don't see the environment uh, prone to further solidarity in, in Europe. And this brings me to, to one question that, that Branislav asked in his intervention about whether the peripheric European states will ever become central in the project of European construction. And we've seen how uh, Spain and Portugal and other Southern European states, even after three decades or four decades in the Union, remain largely peripheral to the central uh, decision-making uh, process, which is largely perceived, at least uh, from a Southern European uh, perspective, as a Franco-German um, issue. So I'm not very optimistic about, uh, about the, the possibility of further solidarity within the Union. And in fact, I, I see that it will be very probable a renewed um, rise of Euroscepticism around the South and uh, in some cases levels of Euroscepticism. I have a, a survey, an Italian survey, I believe, where it is said that around 49 or 47 percent of Italians want to leave the EU altogether and in Greece the percentages of, of people thinking the EU as a bad business for Greece uh, is around between 60 and 70 percent of all the people surveyed. So I don't see uh, a very optimistic landscape in the future and especially if the corona crisis uh, does not stop uh, in the in the short term, if it's going to continue for let's say a year or a couple of years, even more, uh, further pressure will be uh, put on on this strained relation. So, I am 
pessimistic, though, as I said in my intervention, I don't believe that the union will, will sink uh, as an institutional uh, body because the, the, the links of uh, economic interdependence and especially the debt between member states is so massive that uh, no European, no Southern European country will ever be able to to pay this debt outside the the framework the framework provided by the Union. And uh, to to just give a, a last uh, point to to this brief intervention, Brexit and the um, complications of of Brexit, I think that have uh, vaccinated. Uh, most European states against uh, leaving the Union in the short term because it is perceived as a, an extremely complex process which uh, moreover leaves the country outside uh, its protective net. So I see. that's what I, what I would like to say it, just thank now. You for, uh, well, it is uh, the dream of um, creating um, again a uh, Unity within EU seems to be um, is not possible. Uh, the, the, the prospect of unity is not possible for the short term, but only may survive at this uh, EU as intact uh, as political structure at least if they come up with a well-designed uh, and well-intentioned uh, a solidarity plan for economic cooperation and for the relief of the most oppressed uh, countries. Uh, so that, that might be only opportunity for EU, and I'm not sure about uh, actually if we do have this uh, kind of strong political leaders in Europe, especially at the France and Germany. Uh, it's not, it's not, it, it is too tough. Uh, the only speech I have listened by Chancellor Merkel well, I mean, she was calling for cooperation um, and unity and solidarity. Actually, they did declare, declare a sol uh, call for a solidarity together with the, as a German and Italian together, but it didn't work out so far. Anyhow, thank you uh, for this uh, comments and uh, explanation. Now, uh, turning back to uh, Bernstorff, maybe, uh, you can take up where you uh, already uh, stopped uh, from especially post exit in Britain and uh, possibility of cooperation. Uh, how 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 will <laughs> well, uh, well, well, the the question of the question of Brexit is is very important for for various reasons. And uh, when Brexit um, occurred, really, when when it was uh, voted. Um, it um, was often interpreted as um, as the beginning of fragmentation of the European Union, right? So many, many analyses that were produced immediately afterwards were really about the impact of the UK leaving the European Union on the European Integrationist Project and who could potentially be next wishing to leave the European Union. Now we have seen actually that the whole Brexit question has become very complex and very difficult and Borja is right when he says well probably in the near future states who maybe a couple of years ago did think about leaving the European Union will uh, reconsider those ideas or at least put them on, on hold. Um, but now what we really have in the UK is that COVID-19 has put Brexit on hold in, in one way or another, but the parties definitely, both the United Kingdom and the European Union, um, are um, willing to, to proceed with it. And in fact, we have seen that, um, and even Prime Minister Johnson, he said that he, he was not in favor of um, a further delay. Uh, so now they have put in place video conferencing and video negotiations. And there was some discussion about whether that can be successful way of negotiating uh, um, agreements uh, between between the two. Um, um, I somehow tend to tend to tend to believe that the process. Um, is extremely complex still 
and that so many questions um, have remained um, unanswered. And we have seen actually because we are receiving conflicting information from the UK government and the Brussels administration as to which party has done more um, in uh, relation to the successful negotiation of um, of, of Brexit. So, um, and then we also have to take into consideration that because of COVID-19, uh, based on what I read the other day, around 50 officials that were working on Brexit have been redeployed to work on other issues uh, because of the, of the pandemic. Now, the question really is, will the COVID-19 um, economic shock be used to cover up any negative impact of Brexit. There is a very good uh, text in the Independent about that. So to what extent will political elites, and I think this is something that can be actually applied to other elites across the European Union, to what extent will political elites use COVID to gain public support or to actually blame COVID for not being capable of pursuing certain certain policies. And um, with, with that in mind, then we can say that certain elites probably have approached COVID-19 as a part of electoral campaign in order to uh, preserve their office, in order to preserve or even consolidate their standing in the current climate. And therefore, they will later on um, actually their, their support may, may, may even increase. Um, I'm not part of the Brexit team, a negotiating team, so uh, it is uh, pretty difficult to comment on what is potentially happening in those meetings and to what extent the parties um, are progressing and whether they will manage to achieve a proper uh, deal by the 31st of, of December this year. So with that in mind, it, it is um, it is something that we, we cannot be entirely sure. It is very much with the elites uh, that are in charge. But now, since I have spoken about elites, um, and uh, you touched upon this uh, before when talking about Germany and France, um, my fear is that when we talk about the European Integrationist Project, we often ignore the citizens of Europe. We uh, often talk about the Brussels administration. We often talk about what's happening within different institutions in Brussels or in Strasbourg or Luxembourg. But we often, I believe, tend to ignore the role of citizens, the role of us in the European Integrationist Project. And really, whether a person who lives in a remote village, let's say in Poland, knows anything about European Parliament elections. I don't think so. So uh, this makes the European Integrationist Project an elitist project. And this is also something that has been discussed in the literature um, quite often. And in relation to this crisis, then we say, oh, well, COVID represents a very good opportunity for lessons learned. Well, every single crisis has represented an opportunity for lessons to be learned. But the point is, will elites learn the lesson? We have seen that with the financial crisis. We have seen that even with the collapse of Yugoslavia in the in the 90s, right? We have seen that with uh, the refugee crisis. The question is, do the elite sitting in, in this particular case in Brussels, but it can be Washington, it can be Moscow, right? It can be Ankara. Do they learn from their previous experiences? So with this in mind, COVID can represent, because of the gravity, COVID can represent an opportunity so that at one point the elites will say, well, these are the lessons we've learned from COVID. Maybe if COVID-2 happens or the second round, right? So, but uh, there is a good um, interview with uh, Thomas Piketty in the, in, the, in the Guardian. I think it was uh, published uh, yesterday or the day, day before yesterday. And um, the, one of the questions was really about prospects for a fairer, uh, more equal societies, because what we have seen actually across the European uh, Union, we do have certain countries that are definitely struggling with the question of e equality. And, um, um, so to what extent can um, COVID-19 uh, drive corrections 
within our societies in terms of um, making our societies fairer, um, uh, more equal, and so on and so forth. And um, uh, Piketty says, well, uh, the problem is that I I if you have um, free trade and a single currency without social objectives, which is very important, you end up in a situation that you have free mobility of capital, you have all the benefits and so on and so forth, but actually the ones who will be benefiting from those will be wealthy citizens, will be citizens who are extremely well educated, who can travel, who can enjoy the benefits of the European integrationist project, and that is free movement, free this, free that, right? Whereas actually middle and lower classes will remain stuck. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's go. Um, there is a couple of questions from our participants. Let me just uh, read them uh, for uh, your answer. Already, you have answered some of them. For instance, Bushra was asking, could we say that the most members of the EU will always have EU skepticism instead of solidarity when an issue comes to the crisis such as COVID-19. I think we already talked, especially Gonzalez, have also talked. Um, what will be the effect of uh, COVID-19 cooperation between Turkey and uh, from imported countries like uh, Britain, Italy, Spain? Uh, we have been cooperating with them, uh, actually. Um, I don't know, will it create any hope for uh, possibility of, uh, I don't know, renewed membership process with Turkey. Uh, will it change anything? Maybe I, I should ask this question, Gonzalez. Um, how, how Turkey is read uh, from the perspective, within this context especially, how the EU, EU press is reading Turkey, uh, especially the COVID-19, not just general speaking before? Gonzalez? Well, um... I, I, honestly, I am, I am not very much a, uh, an expert on, on the matter of, of Turkey-EU relations, but uh, in my opinion, the, the issue of, of Turkish membership in, in the European Union uh, goes well beyond uh, the, present, the present crisis and affects some aspects of identity that we've commented uh, throughout this, uh, this seminar. Uh, I don't see uh, really uh, a betterment of, of, of those prospects in the short term, at least uh, when one uh, takes a look at uh, public opinion service uh, and so on. However, uh, we've also seen how solidarity with uh, certain EU states has not come from other EU states, but from states from outside the European Union and actually uh, in the Spanish case, there was this, this issue about some breathing machi machines that got stuck in, in Turkey and uh, there was a, a diplomatic deal between, between Spain and Turkey and the machines got finally uh, uh, sent back to, to, to Spain because Turkey realized that, that Spain was in a, in a harder situation than Turkey at that point. Uh, uh, we've seen similar cases, for instance, with the uh, uh, Chinese and Russian doctors coming to, to Italy when no uh, uh, European Union uh, medical uh, team has traveled from Germany or, for, uh, or from the Netherlands, just to, to give two examples, to, to the Southern European states. So perhaps uh, more than increasing uh, Turkey's short-term uh, prospects to, to enter the Turkey may have from certain Southern European states, which have seen how solidarity is an extra European rather than an intra European affair. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Breslau, um, uh, I know, I mean, you're from Britain, not from the inside of Europe, but you are still officially part of that uh, process. Uh, one question is how should member states? Uh, share the fiscal burden of this crisis within the EU? Will, will it be possible or 
everybody will uh, take care of its, its national issue as a separate entity, not the EU wise. I um, I really think at this uh, stage it is very difficult to respond really how this can be uh, dealt with because we have seen how states um, certain states have been uh, reluctant when um, the question of money um, arose with with COVID COVID nineteen uh -huh. so um, to really say who will take which part in, in, in it, uh, it, it is very difficult. As I said before, whenever we have economic crisis and definitely COVID-19 is linked to an economic crisis post-COVID, it will be very difficult and we are most likely then talking more about intergovernmental uh, way of fixing, fixing issues. So it will be pretty much um, um, down to that. Now, we also have seen that before with the financial crisis in 2008, uh, how divided the European Union was and how um, this might sound a bit um, like a stereotype, but how everybody believed that there is a super hard working North and a very lazy South wow. in Europe. And uh, when it comes to the very lazy South, it was very much about uh, Greece, uh, but then Italy, Spain, Portugal, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the super hard working um, um, some other parts of Europe, in Germany, for example, right? So uh, this, in such situations, um, is not very helpful. We we saw that during the the, the crisis. So in this case, particular one, uh, we will see really to what extent the states will be willing to cooperate and discuss really financial issues and implications, of course, because some states will be affected more, some states will be affected less. And in fact, uh, now even the European Commission is taking steps. We, we saw today that actually they are saying that uh, Mediterranean states should be um, opening uh, slowly because they know what r role in terms of uh, economic performance of those states uh, tourism plays. And therefore, um, the, the latest that we've heard from the European Commission is that actually a lot of emphasis should be placed how to start opening so that they will not have a completely lost uh, summer season in terms of uh, tourism, knowing what um, amounts come from that activity. Uh, okay, thank you uh, very much for uh, this comment. Uh, if you have anything uh, to add uh, for the last uh, remark, perhaps, uh, then uh, in two minutes uh, we will close this, this webinar, this seminar uh, tonight. Uh, anything from you, Gonzalez, to say? Uh, well, um... I've been uh, very happy to participate in this seminar, and I would like to say that uh, the, the um, response to the crisis, uh, I don't see very much of a role for the European Union as an institutional uh, body, uh, but an emphasis, on, a renewed emphasis on intergovernmentality. Uh, the, the thing about the touristic corridors that Branislav just, just mentioned, was received in Spain by uh, the, the idea of the government to put all passengers coming from abroad in a 15-day long quarantine, which to some extent seems to reflect this lack of coordination between the European institutions and the national institutions. It seems that nobody is uh, working as a team, but each country is trying to devise its own strategies. On the economic side of the issue, uh, the proposal for Corona bonds for further solidarity, uh, I, I am also very pessimistic in so far as uh, the Northern European states are adamant at providing more financial support for the Southern European states, whereas the Southern European states are in a really desperate situation right now. So Thank you. that's Thank my, you for that. my final uh, intervention. For this night tonight. Uh, and the last word from uh, Brands uh, Yes, um, personally, I, I'm I'm waiting to to see how um, governments will behave after COVID nineteen. Um, the question of um, transparency and accountability uh, for the um, outbreak of the crisis has been extremely important, 
And uh, we have seen uh, many, many differences characterizing the behavior of different governments in the European Union, since we are talking about Europe, but we could apply this definitely to, to the global uh, picture of, of, of um, the current uh, situation. So um, it will be very, very interesting to see because what we are having now, for example, in the UK, on the UK uh, Parliament website, there is a petition to hold the public inquiry into the handling of the COVID-19 crisis. So um, according to the petition that is being signed, uh, the government should hold a public inquiry to confirm what decisions were made because there is a major disappointment with the way the government has dealt with, with the outbreak of the COVID crisis and especially because from the very beginning the strategy of the government kept shifting which created a lot of confusion as to what was the right approach towards the crisis so now the petition is almost in, at 10,000 signatures when it reaches 10,000 signatures government will respond to the petition and then when it reaches 100,000 signatures hopefully uh, the petition will be considered for debate in um, in the parliament. Uh, so I think with with this in mind, for example, and uh, I think this is this is a fantastic initiative. It is very important, uh, as you can see, probably uh, when when I talk, I'm very much interested um, in in citizens, in us, in this whole project, the European integrationist project. So um, what really we as citizens receive from our governments, what kind of information? And this is why we see that, for example, in Germany, Angela Merkel can speak for 30 seconds like the other day, and the message is very clear. But we also see in, um, in March, on the 22nd of March, when she delivered her um, fantastic speech, uh, every single sentence was accurate and in place, and people did follow what she said in contrast to many other countries in Europe where people actually did not feel comfortable following what their leaders or representatives uh, said about the outbreak of the crisis. And this is a big thing. This uh, to some extent confirms my previous talk about intergovernmentalism in Europe. In this particular case, we can say for obvious reasons, because there is something obviously that is right in Germany and there is something that is obviously wrong in some other places. And therefore, I think with this in mind, COVID-19 will represent a good, good opportunity for lessons learned that governments really start questioning themselves. Well, why did we fail so badly uh, with coping with, with the crisis? And on the other hand, we have Germany. I mean, Germany has been used, for example, in the UK often when uh, comparing um, the numbers, when comparing the death rates and so on. Uh, so why was Germany so successful and why has the United Kingdom uh, failed so drastically in order to, to address the crisis? Uh, I think that is the main issue. And I just, just the closed meeting, I remember um, a couple of weeks ago, Kissinger at the Wall Street Journal wrote an article and he is a realist. Uh, he calls for um, a multilateralism to deal with the, this kind of uh, crisis, pand pandemics. Uh, no single country can itself can uh, can really respond effectively uh, by itself uh, for such a big, huge uh, crisis. Uh, but as a realist himself, uh, he also, of course, understand that in the time of crisis, for the survivability. Uh, I mean, the, the, the world as nation states act as a realist. Uh, mm -hmm. as we know what realist means, self-help and self-reliance. And yeah. this pandemic actually showed us the realism still well and alive, even in the, con in the um, context of the EU, which is the most liberal project. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a safer bet, yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gents and gentlemen, for this uh, great event today. And hope to see you again, especially if you come to Turkey. Uh, 
hopefully after post pandemic era in istanbul <laughs> i i would be glad to host you for a, a, a lunch or dinner at the bus stop here uh, in istanbul uh, thank you that's a good idea all right please welcome every, every time and greetings from istanbul to uh, all thank you for uh, france and uh, uh, please uh, keep safe and healthy you and the you same our uh, greetings to your families and friends thank uh, in you. Europe. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.